The best thing about Subnautica is that it leaves you with a story to tell. And I don't mean the literal story within the game, but rather the experience that you'll walk away with when it's all said and done. This game is an adventure in every sense of the word. It's difficult, it's stressful, and there's a great sense of satisfaction with each upgrade, discovery, and milestone you make. I'm hesitant to use the word immersion to describe games because that can be twisted to encompass anything you want it to, but here I think it's truly applicable. The game ejects you into an alien world and expects you to figure out how to proceed. There's a certain wonder in exploring such a hostile, isolated environment without much direction. That sense of adventure was my favorite thing about Subnautica. I loved incrementally uncovering this planet piece by piece, learning what happened to my fallen crewmates, and dedicating everything towards further exploring the deep sea. There were parts that I had a lot of issues with, but it drew me in enough that I was willing to stomach them so I could continue on that quest for survival, and for the most part, I think it was worth it. If you're like me and you don't typically enjoy survival games, I urge you to give this one a shot. It may interest you to know that Subnautica does have a story, and there are concrete objectives that you're supposed to complete to reach its ending. It's open-ended in the sense that you can work at your own pace, but just know that you are following a definitive progression path, and I think the game is better for it. That's about all I have to say for the intro, so spoilers will ensue from here. Let's talk about Subnautica. You have suffered minor head trauma. This is considered an optimal outcome. First off, I want to quickly mention that this game has a lot to talk about, so I've added some timestamps to cut up where I talk about specific parts to hopefully make things more digestible. We're going to start by talking about the early game. And let me reiterate something here, I don't really like survival games. I find that they often have an unclear vision and bog themselves down in so much realism that it becomes tedious. It makes the actual survival aspect so prominent, yet so uninteresting. Having to constantly hunt for food and wait for it to cook is boring. Chopping a tree down or standing near a fire to keep warm simply isn't fun gameplay. And you often aren't doing it for some type of goal or objective, you're just in it for the gameplay loop. Subnautica isn't entirely free of these problems, but it is a subversion of the traditional survival formula in many ways. The goal of this game is not to simply survive day after day until you get bored and move on. In fact, many core survival mechanics have been streamlined to be much simpler and quicker bits of interactivity. You start the game out with a shelter, and food and water can be found and crafted near instantly. Resources also don't require any special tools to gather. You can collect almost everything in the game with your bare hands and a survival knife. The fact that Subnautica makes things so readily accessible at the very beginning makes for a much better hook because it allows you to immediately interact with the game's core features. This game has a strong commitment to exploration. There's a lower emphasis on traditional survival mechanics so that it can leverage the extraordinarily vast and beautifully crafted ocean that it takes place in. Pretty much everything you craft is done so you can explore more, whether that means diving deeper or venturing farther out from your initial life pod safe haven. The game is excellent at mixing short-term goals with long-term ones because everything you make in the early game will also be used to contribute to something else later. The recipes for some of the quintessential tools are available immediately, so even though you aren't told where to go directly, you do know what you should actually be looking for down in the ocean. I've seen many people praise the game for not holding the player's hand, and I would mostly agree with that, but in a sense these early game blueprints are your tutorial. It's kickstarting the hunt for early game resources and encouraging you to interact with as much as you can since anything could be holding a material that you need. For example, the repair tool is needed since it fixes your broken radio, and that item requires a piece of cave sulfur. So you're gently being nudged towards exploring some early caves, which will also teach you about things like mining for outcrops and introduce some predators like the crashfish, which I still remember the initial scare one gave me the first time I heard it. This sort of thing is a smart way of getting the player acquainted with the safe shallows, and by extension, the loop of diving underwater and picking up as much as you can before your oxygen depletes. It gets you comfortable with movement in the water and teaches you your limitations. It's a subtle but really clever way of teaching the game's rules. The early blueprints double as both a small checklist of initial tasks and to give you a little dopamine rush whenever you find something that you recognize from a recipe. This is a big part of what I mean when I say Subnautica does have concrete objectives. The game always has something that you could be working towards, and rarely leaves you wandering about trying to find something to do. And I think giving the player a bit of a foundation to start with in this way was a good decision. It's still up to you to figure out where to find titanium, copper, and so on, but you know what to look for. It's better than letting the player stumble about and hoping they'll fall in the right direction. You still have to discover and synthesize most blueprints in the game yourself, but that still somewhat ties into story progression, which we'll be talking about later. Having a start like this tells me the game knows what it wants to be. It's always about seeing more and delving deeper. As you progress out of the early game, Subnautica has something of a domino effect. 
you'll make something from a blueprint so you can explore more things, so you can find new blueprints, craft from those, and explore even further than that, and so on. What's particularly great about the early game is that nothing you make is truly useless in this regard. All of the equipment, the scanner, the knife, the repair tool, they all see regular use during exploration for the entirety of the game, while also still having an immediate use that makes them worth crafting. I was fixated on getting as much mileage out of each dive as possible, so I made it a priority to craft an upgraded oxygen tank. I wanted to spend more time underwater. Then I found myself really wanting the sea glide so I could swim faster and cover more ground. I was never punished for making these decisions. The game doesn't need nor want you to play in any particular way during this phase. The first seven or so hours of Subnautica might be the best part because of this. You're absorbing tons of information about how the world works and thinking of ways that you can use that information to your advantage. The beginning of a game is usually the hardest to get past, so the fact that Subnautica made it so engaging is very impressive on its own. After fixing your radio, you'll start receiving signals that serve as your guide for progressing the story. Many of these are distress calls from your fallen crewmates that direct you around the ocean as an incentive to explore more. Others are signals from Altera scientists trying to communicate in the hopes that they can rescue you, and it's those messages that advance the plot in more significant ways. The purpose of the distress calls, I think, is to guide you to places that you might not otherwise find while exploring on your own. You aren't required to respond to most of them to advance the story, but they often lead you to a new biome or cave system, and scanning the fragments at the shipwrecks there will unlock more blueprints. It's this early to mid-game period of responding to distress calls that you'll really get an idea of what exploration means in this game. I think it was wise to send players to new places deliberately rather than having them find them themselves, because simply being an underwater adventure makes Subnautica's world much more complex to navigate. I'm confident that I never would have found some of these deeper caves without a life pod signal guiding me to their locations. Being in an ocean gives the world a lot of possibilities. The most important consideration is that it gives the player free control over their elevation. Along with the usual north, east, south, and west, you can move up and down. It's much more three-dimensional. This naturally means that there's a lot of verticality to Subnautica's world, and the game was sure to leverage this because the ultimate goal is to go deeper and deeper. The final biome is a whole 1400 meters underwater. A lot of that is what piqued my interest in the planet to begin with. I was curious to see how the game would present its world now that depth was a consideration along with width and length. On this front, it succeeds in some areas and falls short in others. The game does very well on the atmosphere and aesthetic side of things in its underwater sections because of artistic talent and sound design. The ocean is creaking and groaning around you as you explore, with noises that are only exacerbated the deeper you go. A lot of the ocean creatures are giant, and some of them look very menacing, especially when viewed from afar, so there's this looming threat of the unknown sitting in your mind as you explore. It taps into some very traditional fears. A fear of the dark, the fear of being eaten by a monster, there are things that have been achieved time and time again in other games, but the mysterious nature of the ocean lends to the tension much better. I've seen some people describe Subnautica as a horror game, and I don't think it goes that far, but it is unsettling, and I like it for that. The visuals are also good, albeit less consistent than the sound design and atmosphere. Some of the biomes are a visual spectacle to draw you in. I remember really enjoying the Bulb Zone and the Jelly Shroom Caves for how much ambient lighting they give off. These regions mostly have unique identities thanks to the visuals, like the aforementioned giant glowing mushrooms or the giant tree you can find in the Lost River. From an aesthetic standpoint, I think most of the biomes were very well done. The only gripe I had that I feel is worth mentioning is that certain textures look really bad when viewed up close, and it's especially odd when contrasted with the larger environments. This was most obvious when I got close to the Aurora for the first time. It looks fine from your life pod, but when you get up close the textures on the ship are extremely grainy and blurred. It also happened a lot during the land sections on the mountain or floating islands. It honestly looked like you stepped into a different game. I don't usually like to harp on graphics too much, but it stuck out a lot especially when compounded with some performance issues that were consistent throughout the entire game. My PC well exceeds the recommended requirements, but running around here still felt choppy sometimes, so it doesn't really invoke the same atmosphere that the other areas have. My hunch is that the Aurora and these large land masses weren't really meant to be viewed from up close because they look fine from afar, but it's still something I question since the underwater environments look so much better in comparison. On the functional side of things, the game does use depth and verticality in enough interesting ways that I'd consider it well done. It's definitely something that's most unique to Subnautica. The perspective that you take on just by nature of constantly being underwater leads to some cool moments of exploring. It can be difficult to keep your way because the caves or wrecks look like they get turned around on you as you move through them, and I thoroughly enjoyed those moments, however brief they were. 
descending into smaller caves can also be much more intimidating because unless you have a vehicle, your oxygen will be limited, and there's the threat of losing your way and not being able to swim to the surface in time. Cave entrances and air bubbles can be much harder to keep track of when you have to consider both depth and direction. Sometimes this was scarier than anything else the game offered, the threat of getting stuck in the ocean and not being able to find your way back to the surface. There's a sense of panic that sets in when you realize you might have gone too deep and aren't sure how to ascend back to an air source. It's another example of the game taking advantage of some common fears, being stuck in tight spaces with no way out. There are also cave systems that are large and deep enough to be considered their own biomes, rather than just being land stretched across the ocean floor. These are a little bit different since you'll often be coming in with a vehicle, so you'll be able to visit for some more long-term excursions. When trying to claw your way out of these places, simply swimming upwards often won't cut it, because cave biomes are enclosed with only a few entrances. I especially remember this happening a lot in the inactive lava zone, where finding your way back can be confusing since it's so vast. The verticality of Subnautica's world is used well in these ways. You can lose your bearings a lot more easily, even with beacons marking important waypoints, and that makes for a lot more interesting adventures. Finding your way out of a biome can be just as much a part of the expedition as exploring and spelunking was. It's harder to retrace your steps when you get lost, invoking a realization that you've swam too far out to sea. I still think there's some untapped potential here when it comes to the most narrow areas you can explore. Some of the wrecks are very maze-like because you can move in all directions, and they were the most fun ones to find because you get spun around so easily. The perspective of being underwater is really interesting when applied to tight buildings and corridors. More wrecks or caves that were modeled in this way could have been really fun to navigate, but unfortunately, they're pretty few and far between. I also want to note though that I didn't use the Pathfinder tool. It wasn't intentional, I just never bothered to craft it. Inventory space is already a valuable resource, and it didn't feel necessary since I was usually able to stumble my way out of a cave anyway. That's why I think I got lost in caves more often, something I consider a blessing more than a curse. I wouldn't say the Pathfinder ruins that element of the game, but it is interesting to see how gameplay changes when you play with those kinds of limitations. So that's all well and good. The game has a world that mostly looks great, it has a memorable atmosphere, and it sets itself apart with deep sea diving and a strong emphasis on verticality. Soaking all of that in is great for a majority of the time, but the vastness of Subnautica's world can be a double-edged sword. Exploring becomes significantly less fun when you stop doing it how you'd like and start specifically hunting for something that you need. The biggest limiting factor on your progress will probably be not having the right blueprints. There are a select few that you need to synthesize in order to progress. They're most easily found in Wrecks of the Aurora, but there's so much land to cover that simply moving from one point to another isn't very fast. It makes trying to find new blueprints involve a lot of aimless wandering. Unless you get a distress signal leading you to one, finding a wreck is pretty much up to luck. There's nothing else that indicates where they might be unless you set up scanner rooms everywhere. Trying to find them deliberately is when I'd say exploration can be boring, but again, you'll probably need to do it because it's the most reliable way to find new blueprint parts to scan. To put it in a different context, it kind of reminded me of searching for environmental puzzles in The Witness. The beauty of the world is lost on you because your focus is on specifically finding something that can be so well hidden. Either that or the world is complex enough that it's just too easy to miss. I got the same sense of boring exploration whenever I had to farm for resources. This wasn't as bad since scanner rooms are good at finding what you need, but it's still a drag. You need an absurd amount of titanium throughout the game. It's the most used component in base building, and either titanium ingots or plasteel ingots are common in crafting recipes towards the mid and end game. Because of this, there was never a point where I felt like I had enough titanium to last me for an extended period. Copper is similar, you don't need as large volumes of it, but it's also not as plentiful. I really wish resource farming, at least for these two things, could have been toned down a lot. I can't remember how many times I was in the middle of doing something when a lack of titanium or copper disrupted the process. It could have been building a habitat or crafting some basic materials. I wish I started taking a tally of how much titanium I used throughout my playthrough. I'd wager that it's at least 500 pieces, and I didn't even do very much base building. Building. Much like searching for wrecks, grinding for these low stakes resources entails a lot of swimming around and getting lucky with your findings. In the case of titanium, it's hunting for metal salvage, which will have you bouncing back and forth between your base and the field a lot since those take up so much inventory space. Many players are willing to accept grinding as a part of many games, and I am too, but it annoyed me particularly in Subnautica because it's a constant need. It didn't matter if I was 5 hours in or 30 hours in, I still found myself regularly pausing what I was doing so I could go restock my titanium supply. Inventory management compounds this problem even further because Subnautica's inventory system feels needlessly convoluted. 
Absolutely nothing in this game can be stacked. Every single piece of titanium, copper, every tool, or piece of equipment, they all take up at least one inventory slot, sometimes more. I don't have a problem with that on its own, but the game expects you to gather and keep so many resources and doesn't give you the tools to easily keep track of them. You can't build high capacity lockers until you make a base outside the life pod, so before that you're stuck using underwater lockers that you have to pop in and out of the water to use. They have tiny labels that are difficult to read at a glance, and they're way too difficult to lay out in an organized manner. Their capacities are also really small, so you'll need several of them unless you're willing to keep throwing things away. When you do finally unlock large lockers, you can't label them at all, which I really don't understand. I guess it's to give the wall lockers some kind of advantage, because you can label those, but they already take up less space so I don't think that's fair. There's also no way to mass transport items between a locker and your inventory. It's all done one by one, and your inventory space really isn't that large. Mass transporting items between bases or onto vehicles is equally inconvenient. Now, I can't think of any game where managing your inventory is fun, but it's a necessary burden we put up with to preserve the survival and gathering mechanics. That's why having such a primitive inventory system in Subnautica bothers me so much. There's no way to quickly tell which locker a given resource is in, and since nothing can stack, you'll probably need multiple units just to store a single thing. Considering how much you'll have to carry throughout the game, you would hope there would be a little more organization, but there isn't. The best way I can rationalize all this is that it was done for realism, but that isn't good enough. I would have happily made that concession if it meant getting any semblance of quality of life features for managing your items. I know all of that may have seemed a little ham-fisted, but it was honestly one of my biggest frustrations that I had while playing, so I felt it was worth mentioning. Let's pull back to exploration though. Vehicles are also a big part of Subnautica's gameplay because they have a drastic impact on your perspective in exploration. There are three vehicles that each change the way you move and view the world, and it's not always for the better. I think two of the vehicles are really cool. The last one had a lot of problems that were just enough to make me not enjoy using it very much. The Seamoth is the first vehicle you'll craft, and it's by far the simplest to use. It's mostly just an extension of everything you've been doing up to that point. It controls the same way as regular swimming does, but like all vehicles, it generates oxygen while you're inside. Crafting your first Seamoth is a big milestone, because it opens up so many new possibilities. It feels like you're being freed of a restriction that you didn't realize you had. It's the gateway to finding some of the deeper biomes, and you'll have to rely on the Seamoth to respond to certain distress calls that are too deep for you to venture into on your own. The Seamoth shows how a simple adjustment can have major ramifications on how you play a game. Its primary function is just a mobile oxygen source, but simply having that opens up so many new parts of the world. It warps the way you think about descending. You can now stay underwater indefinitely and park the Seamoth a few hundred meters underwater to use as a starting point, rather than having to swim all the way back up to the surface to refill your oxygen. You're still limited by its crush depth, but even without any upgrades, it still gives you access to a lot of new areas that you never had before. Incidentally, this might become your next set of objectives, crafting upgrade modules that increase the crush depth distance and allow you to bring the Seamoth even deeper. So let's fast forward a bit and talk about the Cyclops. This is probably the thing that most people think of when they imagine deep sea exploration. It's literally just a giant submarine. This thing is overwhelming when you first get it, but learning how to drive it effectively was some of the most fun I had in the game. It felt like being a kid and getting to see the cockpit of an airplane, only you get to actually pilot it. The Cyclops is equipped with its own camera system that you can use to gauge your surroundings, and you'll need it because the thing is so damn long. It's best to think about the Cyclops as a mobile base. It can fit all of the essentials that a regular sea base needs. It has its own storage, you can build modules in it, and it even holds one of your other vehicles the same way that a moon pool does. Much like the Seamoth, it can change how you think about exploring the world. I wasn't really interested in building habitats all around the ocean. I preferred to have a single, centralized sea base with a couple of scanner rooms set up in the places that I explored most frequently. That's why I was excited when I built my first Cyclops. You can bring it with you and live inside it for an extended period of time if you're well prepared. I found this especially important in the endgame when exploring certain biomes takes much more time and effort than before. The Cyclops cuts out a lot of monotony of farming resources to build a base as your starting point. Instead, you can just park in a certain biome and be on your way. It's a lot more convenient, and I'm really glad that the game allows you to play this way. You aren't forced to spend a lot of time on base building thanks to the Cyclops. Just driving it is also very surreal. Constantly checking your cameras to steer clear of any obstructions is really cool, and provides a unique perspective of the ocean. Being in the Cyclops was also when I was most scared of Leviathan-class monsters. They can attack your ship if you aren't careful, and the following panic that can set in is pretty intense. The alarms will blare, and water might start pouring in because of the damage. You can turn on max speed to try and escape, but then you run the risk of overheating your engine and starting a fire. It's a reminder that even with such a behemoth of a vehicle, you're still vulnerable and the planet is still out to get you. These were the other moments in the game that I found the most frightening. 
And that brings us to the prawn suit, the vehicle that I like the least. It's not so much to do with the concept of the prawn, but rather how it handles in practice. It has arguably the biggest shift in perspective out of all the vehicles because it essentially obeys gravity. The prawn suit isn't buoyant, so instead you're walking along the ocean floor while you're inside. This is cool initially because you're seeing a unique world from a more traditional perspective, but the novelty wears off fast because there's not really much benefit to running along the seafloor apart from hunting for mineral deposits. There are two big issues that I have with the prawn suit. One of them speaks to a larger problem that the game has, so I'm going to talk about that after. For starters, the prawn is very awkward to control because it has trouble handling the verticality that the game is built around. It feels very heavy when trying to ascend, especially if you don't get a good jumping start. You'll need at least the jump jet upgrade to make things easier, but even then, I wasn't comfortable using this thing until I got both that and the grappling hook. I wonder if this stiff behavior is intended, or if the developers just couldn't get the implementation right and got to a point where this was good enough. I say that because moving around on solid ground, whether it's on land or in the prawn, feels primitive when compared to the swimming controls that feel so natural. The prawn can be really awkward to move on sloped or rigid surfaces because it's constantly getting stuck inside them, and it doesn't really make for smooth transitions when you're constantly changing elevation and landing to recover fuel. Even if you haven't played Subnautica, I think just watching some footage of how it moves compared to the Seamoth or Cyclops can demonstrate these problems. It feels choppy, you're very slow, and it's like the environment is working against you as you try to walk on it. Using the prawn was also the only time I encountered a bug that I'd consider game-breaking. There are alien portals throughout the world that you can teleport between as essentially fast travel points. At some point I wanted to lug the prawn through one, which is already a pain because the thing controls really badly inside these alien bases, but I had done so once before this and thought it'd be fine. This time though, the game got confused and sent my character falling through the world. I could also hear my prawn taking damage, but all I could see was the transition animation. This lasted for a little bit before I got kicked out of the prawn and all hell broke loose. I started falling really fast through the ground, and the only way I could think to save myself was to quit and reload to an earlier save. Now, full disclosure here, I didn't do that. I started to use console commands after googling this problem and seeing other people run into the same thing. This was the only time I used them during my time with the game. I had done too much since my last save to want to reload, and if it wasn't clear by now, using the prawn already tested my patience enough that I didn't really care. Unfortunately, I also had to spawn myself an entirely new prawn suit, because even though I found my original one, the whole thing was glitched out. I could only hover a few meters off the ground before it fell back down, even with a full tank of fuel. I tried again and again, and it was stuck. Its entire flight system just wouldn't work. I think it was still behaving as if it was on land, even though it was supposed to be in the water. The teleport point was supposed to send it to another land point after all, but somehow it ended up in the ocean right beside a leviathan. So, what does the prawn suit actually have going for it then? Its biggest draw is the arm upgrades, the aforementioned grappling hook, which is mostly a way to make maneuvering easier, and the drill arm, which is the only way to mine large resource deposits at the seafloor. The problem with this is that the prawn suit is the most reliant on upgrades between all of the vehicles. The thing isn't even innately useful in my opinion. When you first craft it, it lacks the mobility of the sea moth and the utility of the cyclops. The grappling hook, the drill arm, none of these are inherent abilities. You have to find blueprints and craft them. This is what sheds some light on further problems with the game for me. Maybe I'm just unlucky, but I never synthesized the drill arm until pretty late, and it's probably the most important out of all the upgrades in terms of progression. By the time you get it, it may not even be widely useful. If you have some scanner rooms set up, I really don't think hunting for deposits with the drill arm is more efficient than just turning on a scan for what you need and swimming around for 10 minutes. Most resources aren't particularly rare, and mineral deposits take a surprisingly long time to mine. You're also more likely to get scanner rooms before the drill, so there's a lot less need to farm deposits to begin with. This demonstrated to me that Subnautica doesn't give itself enough time to utilize its endgame tools. It's not just the drill arm, it's also with the resources that you find in the deepest biomes. There's no concrete point where Subnautica's endgame begins, but I would say it's when you understand that you need to go to the Lost River and Lava Biomes. They're the only places where you can find Nickel and Kyanite, both of which you need to build the Neptune escape rocket that ends the game. The inactive lava zone plus the lava lakes are also where you find the alien bases where the final story events take place. More on the story later though, first off, I was initially very disappointed when I discovered how little Nickel and Kyanite you actually need. You only need 6 Kyanites to beat the game, 4 for a part of the Neptune, and 2 to create a blue tablet that unlocks an alien facility. That's so little compared to how much you need of some other resources, I was still surprised when I came up with that number while doing research for this video. If you also want to make all of the upgrades, you'll need an additional 12, which again, is still pretty tiny. Nickel is similar, you only need 3 to strictly beat the game, plus an additional 8 if you want to craft all the upgrades. 
Now, there are two sides to this situation. My knee-jerk reaction upon first encountering it was disappointment. I spent a lot of time farming for these resources because they were presented as rare and elusive. Plus, given how abundant other resources could be in crafting recipes, I was conditioned to think that I would need a lot of them. I didn't feel rewarded for putting that time in because I only had to use a fraction of what I had gathered, and that was a big part that contributed to the end game being really underwhelming. The final resources you gather aren't very useful, you're just gathering them to finish the game instead of gathering them to make something interesting that you saw. But on the other hand, the game has to end somewhere. You're already acquiring Kyanite when you're almost done, and if it was used in more recipes, then the next logical step would be more content to utilize some hypothetical items that Kyanite could create. But if you add more endgame content, then you're adding to the length of the game entirely, and probably just moving the problem. If it's not Kyanite that's underused, it'll be something else. I don't think it's fair to say that Subnautica is lacking content in terms of gameplay either. You can get at least 25 good hours out of it. At this point, it's a question that you could ask of games beyond Subnautica. How much new content should you be introducing in the endgame knowing that the player won't get much use out of it? I've deliberated on this for a while, and in Subnautica's case specifically, I still consider it an issue because there are areas where I think Kyanite, Nickel, or even Ion Cubes and Uraninite could have been made more useful. Maybe Kyanite could have been used for some lava-resistant vehicle upgrades. Maybe Nickel could have been used for some cool new rooms with the Habitat Builder. Things like that. I'm not saying the endgame needs a total overhaul to incorporate more of its resources into gameplay, but just some little things that you can spot and say, yeah, okay, I want to farm some Nickel for that. Something that doesn't leave you as unfulfilled and asking if that was really it. This may sound very nitpicky, but I'm zeroing in on it because I feel that it would have been a decent way to make the endgame more engaging without reworking it entirely. Even then, it may not be enough because many of Subnautica's endgame tasks are very monotonous. This part of the game is a large departure from the rest. It's no longer about discovery and survival. Instead, the objectives that you're given feel like a laundry list instead of unique goals that will unlock more options. This is understandable initially because it's about wrapping up your adventure. You've seen pretty much everything there is to see, and now you just need to escape. But it falls flat on that execution for a few reasons. The best way I can think to describe Subnautica's endgame is as one long fetch quest. There's a lot of bouncing around to different locations, crafting something and bringing it somewhere else, and gathering all the resources you need to build the Neptune escape rocket. I quite enjoyed that last part just for the scale and spectacle alone, even though it's surprisingly light on the material requirements. It's a cool way to close things out. People can't come save you, so you're gonna have to do it on your own. Good luck. Aside from that, the other endgame goal is to deactivate the planet's quarantine enforcement platform. I'll get into this more in a bit, but for now, the task that this entails is where the endgame drags the most. There's a lot of hopping between your sea base and the alien bases in the lava caves because you need to come back with different tablets to open every door. First, you need a purple tablet to open the alien thermal plant, and then a blue tablet to unlock the full primary containment facility. You have no way of knowing that you need these things until coming across the locked alien doors though. So if you come down here without a purple tablet, which I'd wager most people did their first time, you have to crawl out of the lava zone just to grab one and bring back down. The blue tablet is probably a worse offender of this endgame monotony though. Two blue tablets are required to access all of the primary containment facility. One of them is given to you for free at the thermal plant, but this is the only one in the game that you can find just lying around. You'll use this one to unlock the entrance to the containment facility, but there's another door that leads to the aquarium, an essential room that you need a second blue tablet to enter. The only way to get that second one is through crafting. This means that, after you've entered the containment facility, you're expected to leave the lava zone, climb all the way back up to wherever your nearest fabricator is, craft another tablet, and then come all the way back down. This struck me as really unnecessary, and I'm not sure what the purpose behind it was. Again, you have no way of knowing that you need blue tablets to access the full area, so it's not like you could have came prepared. In fact, you don't even unlock the crafting recipe for blue tablets until you collect the first one from the thermal plant, so it either feels like some intentional padding or a plain oversight by the developers. Going in and out of the lava zone is no small task either. You'll have to navigate through with either the prawn or the cyclops, and as I've mentioned before, they aren't very mobile vehicles. Once you finally access the aquarium, you enter another story event with the Sea Emperor Leviathan and are given another tedious task, a literal fetch quest to go around the world and find five plants to craft an item for her. Again, I'll talk about the story reasons for this later, but this was also something that I just didn't find interesting to do. If you were a more thorough player than me, maybe you would already have all the plants you need and it wouldn't be an issue. 
Otherwise, I've already talked about how aimlessly wandering the world isn't as fun as exploring on your own terms, and to me, this is just another version of that. Since it's basically the last thing you have to do, maybe it could be viewed as giving you one last grand tour of the planet before you finally leave so that you can reflect on everything you've done on your journey. If that is the case, then I have to question why I was able to find three of the five ingredients so close to each other. You can find one in the Bulb Zone, and two in the Lost River, which are connected biomes. I could get into some more nitpicky stuff about the endgame, but I feel like I've made my case here. None of this is as wondrous as exploring during the early and mid-game. I view it as Subnautica going too far with the idea that you have to work for everything to survive. These fetch quests are given to you at a point where you're already comfortable with the world's rules. There's not much reason to send you back out into the world again when you're probably just itching to see the credits by that point. In certain games, slogging through a drown-out endgame like this might be worth it for a payoff in the story. I think JRPGs pull that trick an awful lot. I don't think Subnautica's story has an ending that justifies this, but I also don't think the story does much to actively bring the game down. The reason you've been doing everything we've discussed so far is because you need to escape the planet, one that's simply called Planet 4546B. I enjoy the basic premise of Subnautica, where in the very, very distant future where long-distance space travel is commonplace, and you are the only survivor of the crash-landed Aurora, a spaceship owned by a galactic megacorporation. A big part of this story is finding PDA devices left behind by the fallen Aurora crew. They're small collectibles that unlock entries for you to read, and they detail what happened to other life pods and crew members either during their time on the Aurora or what they did once it crashed. Stop waving it around like that, you'll catch the fuel line- much of the story in Subnautica is told through these databank entries. When I first realized this, I thought it would be a huge drag, especially since there's an awful lot of them to read, but after going through the game, I think it's something that should be embraced because they're surprisingly gripping and well-written. These databank entries could be viewed as a series of contained short stories with characters that had their own journeys completely separate from yours. There's even an entire story about a crew that crash-landed on 4546B years before the Aurora did. It also reveals a lot about how the world works outside of the planet. Certain entries show how dystopian the corporate-run future of Subnautica's world is. Companies are running their own literal galactic empires, and every layer of people's lives seem to be dictated by whichever one they're working under. The concept of personal property barely seems to exist anymore, because Altera takes everything that their employees collect. There's a joke at the end that reveals they were billing you for the resources you gather while fighting for your life on 4546B. Permission to land will be granted once you have settled your outstanding balance of 1 trillion credits. There's an intense fixation on capital and trade that people can't even form relationships without it being legally deemed a fair exchange for both parties. Going through the databank was like falling down an in-game Wikipedia rabbit hole, and it's a unique way of providing some lore for people who are into that sort of thing. Considering Subnautica's world is so mysterious already, it was a smart way of providing more context without having to pad the main plot with it. The things that actually happen to you are, of course, much more elaborate. I won't narrate and dissect the entire plot, that would be too long, and frankly, it's not interesting enough to warrant it. I will say that Subnautica has some very cool singular moments that I wasn't expecting. It's excellent at building up your curiosity because of how it drip-feeds you with larger revelations about the planet as time goes on. For instance, the events of the Sunbeam blew my mind when I first saw them. I'd imagine this is the first time most people encounter alien technology on 4546B, so it's immediately a little unsettling because you'll start to question if you really are alone here. As the ship is coming to rescue you, you see the quarantine enforcement platform start to react, and then you might realize where this is going. Change course. Set thrusters to full. Now, not only do you know how the Aurora crashed, but a new threat seems to have emerged, alien technology that's far more difficult to predict and protect yourself from. If you're brave enough to explore the base, you'll realize that it's empty after all, but you'll also get a better sense of what's really going on here. A similarly memorable moment is when you're tasked with exploring the fallen Aurora, since it's the only place you can find blueprints for the escape rocket. This was probably the only land section in the game that I had fun exploring since you're rewarded with so many things. There's tons of PDAs lying around for you to read, and for better or for worse, it's where you get the prawn suit. There are also some little puzzles where you have to use databank entries to figure out passcodes to some locked doors, which was a really cool way to intertwine gameplay and story. So why did I say earlier that the story is nothing special? Well, outside of the databank entries and cool plot twist moments, there really isn't a whole lot here. 
The reason the quarantine enforcement platform exists is because of the Kara bacterium, an infectious disease that ravaged the planet a thousand years ago. It was set up by a precursor race that tried to find a cure before they all succumbed to the Kara. Obviously they failed, and that task has been passed to you if you want to get out of here. You do this by discovering a creature held in captivity that secretes an enzyme capable of fighting the bacteria. The Sea Emperor Leviathan is the one who gives you that fetch quest I mentioned earlier. She says that she'll give you the cure in exchange for you crafting a hatching enzyme so her young can hatch and live freely. A lot of this felt very contrived and artificial, which is why I don't think very highly of it. If you start thinking about the story in more detail, a lot of it doesn't really make sense. Like, how were the humans never aware of the Kara until now if it was so deadly? Were they not capable of viewing the planet from space and finding out about the quarantine enforcement platform before trying to land? And I really don't understand why the Sea Emperor Leviathan falls over and dies right after you hatch her young. I guess it was from old age, but that's a damn unlucky coincidence for it to happen literally the minute after her babies are born. It's clear that they were willing to contrive a lot of these things for the sake of gameplay and atmosphere. I'm willing to accept that choice and hand wave most of the confusing bits, but I think this story can understandably be ruined for a lot of people if they try looking into it a little bit further. I'm still glad there is a story at all because it gives the game a concrete ending, but at the end of the day, I still don't think you should play Subnautica for its story, you should play it for your own story. I spent the majority of this video discussing the game's problems, but I think it's a testament to its high points that I went through all of that and still consider my journey on the planet to be a positive one. With its underwater setting and commitment to exploration, Subnautica tries to do things differently for a survival game, and it's a resounding success at that for the early and mid-game. I just find myself wondering if Unknown Worlds backed themselves into a corner when they decided to give the game an ending, because it does regress as time goes on. It raises an important question, was having an end goal the right decision for Subnautica? Even if it wasn't executed perfectly, I still think the answer is yes because it allowed for everything else to have a clear direction to head in. There's a more demonstrable conclusion, and you can look back on your adventure to remember everything you accomplished, rather than exhausting the game of its exploration and mechanics until you abandon it. In a sense, it leaves you with more to reflect on. I'm glad I played Subnautica even if it didn't suck me in the way it did for many people. It had a clear vision that was mostly realized, and I'm glad to see it was such a success. With so many games trying to artificially create an experience for you, it's refreshing to have something that puts control back in the player's hands. There's no right or wrong way to approach Subnautica, however you go on this adventure is up to you. The risks you take and the things you learn are all done by yourself, so even if the ending doesn't have that same promise, you're still left with a strong sense of fulfillment. Granting such a memorable personal experience might be Subnautica's greatest achievement. There are a lot of ways I can imagine things morphing with the recent release of Below Zero. I haven't played it yet, but if I ever do, I'll certainly be back here to talk about it. If that ever happens, I hope you'd be interested in coming back for that discussion. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Five, four, two, one.